This is the beautiful M4 MacBook Air. And you might remember that in my last video, I said something that struck a chord with a lot of you. Buying the base model, this one here with only 256 gig storage, might have been a big mistake. And to be fair, at times, I'll be honest, I still think that. But here's the thing, as I love to do here on this channel, I wanted to include your suggestions because they make these videos better. Way more interesting for me to create them and hopefully interesting for you to watch them as well. And one of the suggestions I got, and thank you to everyone who suggested this, was to step into the shoes of a graphic designer or a creative worker of some sort and really put this thing through its paces in that kind of very specific workflow without the cliche of, you know, here on YouTube, just using video editing as an example. Because maybe, just maybe, the M4 MacBook Air is not a mistake for everyone. So today we're gonna to be doing a full day of design work using this base model with all the apps that I've learned or the ones that I use myself. So just a quick recap on all the full specs that we've got here. We've got the cheapest model here, the amazing M4 chipset with 10 core GPU, 16 gig of unified memory and only 256 gig storage. No active cooling and yet this thing has been incredible. It actually stopped in my tracks in my last video. If you haven't watched that, save it for later because I was really trying to push it with multitasking, rendering a 3D model uh, with Blender and I'm still shocked by how well it performed with like 40 tabs open in total, you know, crazy amount of multitasking going on, including video editing. It's insane how well it performed. But that 256 gig of internal storage does fill up very quickly. I mean, Mac OS itself, you know, by the time you've, you've got out of the box, you've only got 215 gig uh, to play with. So it does fill up very quickly, especially if you use Adobe, you know, cache files from Adobe are crazy big, temporary project exports and raw image libraries as well. I do have a tool I'm gonna to talk about in a moment. If you're creative and you're thinking of using the MacBook Air as a full-time workstation, just keep that storage size in mind. Honestly, I think it's outrageous really that Apple has the nerve really to sell a laptop in 2025 with less storage than a mid-range smartphone. I won't get any invites to, to Cupertino for saying that, but I don't care really, I care about you. It is outrageous, it's, it should be unacceptable, but to give some credit to Apple, I mean, I won't go into the rant, but <laughs> what I want to say is overall, this machine is crazy value. It's insane what you get, even if you upgrade the, the storage to 512 gig, which is the model that I regret not buying. Now you might spot some mistakes here, just being putting, putting my hand up in here, because what I'm trying to do here is to learn from you, from my viewers, some of the workflows and I will get things wrong. I'm not, I'm not proficient in some of these apps. I do use Photoshop for, running this channel. So Photoshop, I'm kind of comfortable with, Lightroom, but there are things in here like Figma and stuff like that that I've had to learn on the, on the fly. So apologies if you spot stuff wrong in here, but I try to do my best to, you know, to push this machine using some instructions and some Googling as well. So we're starting with a logo design and brand guideline document here in, in Illustrator. Arguably one of the lighter workflows that we're gonna do here, but still a fairly good way to stretch the machine if you start scaling things up and duplicating things. So that's what we're gonna do. Now this file that you're seeing here is a common document in, in marketing, right? It's a full brand identity uh, system. That's about 30 artboards in here. So again, probably not the biggest uh, system that you see, but big enough for us to play with. I grabbed this template online, so I haven't created this, but according to some of the, the real pros out there, it's exactly the sort of thing that a graphic designer would do when preparing a full guidelines doc for a client, you know, with logo rules, typography, mockups, color palette, you know, the whole lot really. Uh, I started by duplicating a few of the artboards in here, and as you can see, you know, tweaking the, the global color styles just to test how well it handles live updates. But even when you just kind of zooming into the artboard and you know kind of just moving around with this many artboards, you do start seeing the the GPU uh, history. Uh, you can see that the, the graphic cards is, is you know is doing its thing, and memory wise, you do start seeing some some consumption in there. This type of workflow kind of simulates that you know working with real client projects where every sort of deliverable needs to be exported in, in multiple formats. So I've done that here. And when it came to export everything, SVG, PDF, EPS, PNG, it didn't blink. You know, it was very quick to do. That export bar barely had time to, to show, kind of to appear and get comfortable. <laughs> and so far in this workflow, without a lot of multitasking, to be fair, the M4 MacBook Air is chugging along, handled everything with absolutely perfection. 
But yeah, even though this is the base model, this workflow that we've seen so far is not that heavy anyway. So, so far, so good, right? By the way, I'm not the creator of these pieces either. You know, these are templates that I got either from some of you or online, but I have managed to at least try and push it. I can see that the machine is, is doing the work. Even when exporting a dozen variations of different file formats, the base model kind of breeze through without breaking a sweat. So I wasn't really happy with the, you know, the export that I did earlier. So I tried to do a bigger export with more formats and it's taking longer. And I can see that the machine then did get pushed a bit harder. It didn't use a lot of swap files. We'll talk about swap files later, but the, the machine, you know, the memory pressure was definitely in the orange now, which is um, expected when you're doing a lot of export. But again, within a minute or two, it finished the export and the machine is now back to normal. And when it was exporting, nothing really froze or anything. You, you know, I didn't see the, the beach ball or anything like that. It was, it was just busy, as you'd expect, but it behaved perfectly fine after that and it's still chugging along again. So for the next workflow, let's add a bit more multitasking into the mix because that's when you see a more real life sort of situation with lots of Chrome tabs open and simulating a real workday. So I started by launching Figma here and opened up a fairly large project, dozens of frames, multiple design systems, interactive components, pretty typical for you know people who do like UX, uh, UI design, all of that whilst you know juggling client work, you know, again, browsing and downloading stuff. And as you navigate through the pages, you know, duplicated elements and rearrange some component sets, Spotify and YouTube playing in the background as well, about 30 Chrome tabs to, to start with. And despite all of that going on, performance stayed solid. If I went to 40 tabs in Chrome though, then there was a brief sort of hiccup switching between browser windows, not all the time, maybe once or twice, but nothing that interrupted kind of the flow of work but that's when I think you start to hitting a limit. When you get to like 40 tabs or above with 16 gig, of course, you know, the more tabs you've got, the more memory you, your machine will consume. Some people prefer Chrome, some people prefer Safari for memory consumption. I mixed both just to kind of see, you know, how the machine behaves. And in that situation, you do start seeing some swap files being used. And swap files, if you don't know, is basically, you know, in memory terms, is essentially when Mac OS or any OS really for that matter, is using the storage, the SSD, internal SSD as an overflow for memory. So it's like, I'm too busy, but I can use some, um, you know, of your local storage. And all of that again, makes this 256 gig model a bit of a dangerous choice, right? Because if you are running up to, you know, not much space left and memory can't use swap files on your internal disk, the whole thing will basically, you know, grind to a halt. I hope you're not bothered about continuity. It's a few things different in the background here, different hat, whatever. <laughs> but I'm jumping between uh, different pages in this Figma file. Each, by the way, Figma is awesome. I, is, I'm very new to this and it's incredible what you can do with it. Each of these pages within iOS 26, or as a big design file, I suppose, has dozens of frames. So I'm just tabbing and panning across and zooming in and out and kind of you know tabulating between the different elements. You can see a little bit of a slowdown when you open like ridiculous amount of tabs in Chrome and you start using uh, swap files. But yeah, it stays pretty responsive as I navigate and duplicate these components and mess around with them a little bit, zoom in and out. Let me know if you think this is good or not. For me, it's incredible. Again, it's one of those things that you see that it shouldn't be this good just based on what I'm doing. But maybe maybe it's not that impressive, you know, the, the experts out there, let me know. The M4 MacBook Air, base model and all, can still absolutely hold its ground if you're a little bit mindful of, you know, heavier background apps. So if you're using, say, Photoshop or Lightroom, perhaps don't run another heavy app at the same time. But multiple tabs and one or two heavy apps is absolutely fine. Now, before we get into even heavier stuff, a quick shout out to Clean My Mac for sponsoring this video. It's an Apple notarized app by Mac Paul, and it's been around since 2008. It recently made it to the App Store's 2025 shortlist for the best 25 apps of the year, which tells you something. If you remember my Mac mini videos, you remember me using this app. It worked wonders on the Mac mini, but also on the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro. Clean My Mac has evolved from just a cleaning app to a more holistic Mac care tool. And this new smart care dashboard gives you full control over your Mac's performance, optimizing storage, clearing clutter, and even helping with overheating your battery drain 
via its handy assistant and menu app. You can get rid of those pesky duplicates in your downloads, clear development junk as well, and even scan for malware with our Moonlock engine. This app is great value. Clean My Mac clears the path for creativity. And the best thing as a viewer of my channel, you can try it for free for seven days. And when you're ready to purchase, you can use my code AlexGear for 20% off. Get tidy today. And thanks so much, Clean My Mac, for sponsoring this video. And look, not just saying this because they sponsored the video. If you're like me and you went for the base model, or perhaps you just need to work with large files, large like image libraries bouncing between lots of apps and constantly running out of space on your Mac, this tool is honestly a lifesaver. Really can't recommend it enough. Just try it out. Now onto Photoshop in Lightroom. This is where things can get a little bit more interesting, right? I loaded a few hefty PSD files in here with 30, 35 layers, including smart objects, you know, adjustment layers. This is kind of where sometimes, you know, on a busy thumbnail, perhaps, and I, I do get to close to that level if I really have the time. Most of the time is I'm in a rush, but all of these little features that in Photoshop, you know, these little effects that you add layers and layers of adjustments, these little things add up in terms of memory usage as well. But again, the MacBook Air, even with multiple documents with those layers, handled brush tools, masking, and all of these little effects very smoothly. There was a slight delay, again, when switching between smart filters and high-res image crops, but nothing like workflow breaking. You know, exporting a set of large JPEG and TIFF files Works without any issue, though I did hit the memory ceiling a couple of times, especially again with multitasking. Because there's no point just running one app and saying, hey, it looks fine, you know, because that's not how we work, right? Most people, at least I think, will have multiple things going on. That's what you expect of a machine. You want to run multiple tabs, you want to be running multiple applications, and you are switching. You are kind of, you know, dealing with things that come in. It might be a meeting, it might be a uh, recording, it might, whatever it might be, you will be doing multiple things during the day. So yes, there's definitely a limit, like the Mac Mini as well. I don't know if you've seen those videos that I've done, but again, there are, there is a point where, okay, it, it has enough, you know, there's no swap files or, you know, activity monitors you can see here, show that the, the memory pressure is going orange here and there. And it was usually when I was trying to do something a bit silly, like exporting hundreds of raw images or trying to render a file at the same time or having too many tabs. And the recommendation here, at least as a guide, right? I don't want to tell you what to do. I think only you will know how heavy you're going to push this. But as much as I don't like spending extra on upgrades and recommending spending any money with Apple, <laughs> is unfortunately, you have to get the 24 gig of RAM if you get close to what I'm showing here today. Apps like Photoshop and Lightroom will take all the memory they can get. They're very archaic in that sense but 24 gig will just give you that extra bit of breathing room, keeping in mind that Mac OS itself, you know, when under a lot of memory stress, will be very clever and try to help you by <laughs> relying on swap memory, but that comes at a cost and it's the cost is performance. A lot of swapping can significantly slow things down. But in a more realistic scenario, and as you can see here, even in scenarios that are perhaps unrealistic, it takes a lot to max out a 16 gig of RAM. Now, memory aside, here's something that actually helps me, not just on, on the MacBook Air, but on any computer. And if you're concerned about storage, maybe this will help you as well. Let's say that you don't want to upgrade the storage or you can't upgrade the storage beyond, say, 512 gig, which is, for me should be the minimum. And honestly, if you're working with heavy files like videos or thousands of raw images, and you don't want to go to that MacBook Pro or Mac Studios, that's where an external SSD setup comes in. I'm not sponsored by these guys, by the way, but I swear by them. I constantly recommend them because they are incredible. Yes, there's a trade-off in convenience, especially when, you know, if you bought the MacBook Air, you probably like the fact that it's extra portable, right? That's the whole point of the MacBook Air. But I have been using this four terabyte Lexar NVMe storage here with Acasis. Acasis is like an enclosure that you put SSDs in. Honestly, it's at least just as fast. And in some cases, if you're using the Mac Mini with M4 Pro chip, for example, it's faster than internal storage. You know, it's crazy. So project files, uh, backups, even app libraries for my Final Cut Pro projects, which can be like 20 gigs, sometimes 30 gig. Offloading these heavy projects into this solution here will give your MacBook Air a much needed uh, breathing room from a storage perspective. So was it still a mistake to buy the base model with only 256 gig storage? For me personally, yes. As someone who likes to dabble in 3D work and learn about things like LLM work sometimes, definitely a mistake for me. Truly not being over dramatic here, but yeah, 256 gig is simply not enough for me. And I'm pretty sure that's not gonna be enough for a lot of people. But 
If your workflow is mostly vector layout, photo editing, and some UI UX, without going to the extreme of multitasking that I shared here today, the M4 MacBook Air, even at the base model, is shockingly capable. I mean, like I said, it stopped in my tracks in my previous review because it took a lot to make it even break a sweat. You don't need to spend a fortune to get like good results. Just be smart about RAM, storage, without going overboard with Apple and keeping your machine nice and clean as well with things like clean my Mac. If you do all of that, the M4 MacBook Air is a fantastic value for money laptop, pretty much like the Mac mini is from a desktop perspective. Let me know in the comments what kind of work you do with the MacBook Air and whether you'd go for the base model or upgrade it. And if you're still undecided, check out my original M4 MacBook Air review here, where I go into performance, cooling, or the lack thereof, and just general day-to-day -day use.